Wow. <laughs> Talk about a big entrance. It's the, I'm talking about my belly, you know, the big entrance, nothing else. <laughs> so, uh, some of you have noticed that uh, I've been moving around from country to country. Those of you who are my dear friends on Facebook or LinkedIn probably see some, I got a post uh, from places like uh, Lagos, Nigeria to, uh, I was just in uh, Moscow, a few days before that I was in uh, Kazakhstan, a few days before that I was in Bahrain, in Oman, I was in Saudi Arabia, yeah, all over the world. So you might be wondering what the hell is wrong with him? You know, the guy who doesn't know where to go or has Zora been kicking me out and uh, there is no more room for me at home. I mean, I, I deserve to be kicked out. I'm not the best husband traveling all the time, but uh, there is a little bit of rhyme and reason for what I've tried to do. So we have created this huge global initiative called Bit Amina. Amina is Asia, Middle East, North Africa. And in three languages, in Arabic, Farsi, and Turkish, it means integrity, honesty. So how can we spread bits to improve the world and bring a high level of integrity, honesty, and cooperation everywhere. So what is it all about? We have uh, two academic partners in addition to Harbor Space. I need to update the slide, it just hit me. I forgot to do that yesterday. And two acceleration partners, which this needs to be updated. At least we have got some more updates about our trustees. The amazing Skoll Foundation, founded by Jeff Skoll, and actually you will see later on the amazing executive director, Sally Osberg, will give a talk. She has graced us to come and join us. Perkins Coy, a law firm, with branches all over and close to a thousand lawyers. You will hear more probably from uh, Arman, Arman Palavan, and uh, Global Venture Alliance, uh, one of the best uh, accelerators in Russia, CIS countries that I've seen, and you will hear more about them also. We all have seen the drop of price of oil. This is great. We see that Maybe we can save our planet and stop polluting the air. And uh, we saw a lot of coal companies stop producing coal, and that's great. You know, over a million people died in China last year from lung cancer. So Chinese government is not creating new utility companies based on coal. About 200 coal plants all over the United States, which were operating, have closed on in the last couple years. And a lot of them who were supposed to start were canceled. So the good news is maybe, maybe we can save our planet if we move fast and with the newest uh, conference on climate at uh, Marrakesh for UN, hopefully the trend continues. So that's the positive side of it. The negative side of it is over 30 countries have been affected significantly by the drop of price of oil. And another 30 companies have been affected by the drop of price of gas. If you combine these two lists, we are talking about 45 countries globally. And this is just the beginning. This data is as of 2013. As the price of oil keeps dropping, and it will drop because alternative energy has already crossed the inflection point in November of 2014 to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity out of solar, 
it was 5.5 cents versus the cheapest fossil base was seven cents, that was coal. When I saw this, two power plants, one in the state of Texas, which is the heartland of oil, another one in the state of uh, Oklahoma, which is the heartland for gas. When these two states, those of you who are familiar with America, these are not progressive states like uh, California, Oregon, Washington. They really promote drill baby, drill baby, those kinds of things. The power plants, because of economic reasons, move to solar. Some of the other ones have moved to wind, alternative energy, which is green. So this situation is going to get worse within the next 20, 30 years. Solar is everywhere. The batteries are coming along. It's free. Why do we need all these crazy oil and gas companies? Why do we need to make money at the expense of destroying our planet, killing our children? So 45 countries are going to have adverse economic effects. Now, if we took out the ones which are in Europe or in the continental America, primarily Latin America, a couple in US and uh, north uh, from neighbor of us, Canada. But our economies over there are diversified, so it's not affected as much, maybe on the state of Calgary in Canada. If we eliminated those, guess what? The rest of them are in 38 countries across Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, and Southeast Asia, hence the name Amina. Now, this is a very interesting observation. All of these are developing countries. All of them have a huge population of young people. And we all know when young people don't have jobs, that is not good. All of these countries have youth unemployment above 20, 25%, some of them as high as 50%. Now, when there is shortage of jobs, our world is respect for the elders, old guys like me, right? So old people keep their jobs. It's the young people who graduate from high school, from university, who don't get jobs. So when the countries publish their unemployment rate, you have to add a lot more to the number of unemployed youth. The percentages are a lot higher. There is another observation, if we map the Islamic countries, this is a very interesting coincidence that 32 of these countries are Muslim majority countries. Why does that matter? Why do I bring it up? Well, in these 32 countries, majority of these, because they're Muslim majority countries, if a young man does not have a job, he cannot marry, find a good wife. Why? Because the father of the bride has to approve the marriage. It's traditional way. So you're a young man and you don't have a job and you can't get a wife. Guess what, in many of these, if they're religious countries, no wife, no sex. That's the truth. I was talking about this in Saudi Arabia. So many uh, Saudi young people came and thanked me for bringing this up and discussing it. Same in Bahrain, same in Jordan, anywhere I go and talk about these issues. Now, there are over 20 
organizations who know this. Because let's say if you are in Russia and you don't have a job, you don't get a wife, you can still have a girlfriend. If you can't get a girlfriend, you can go and drink a lot of vodka. Islamic countries, majority of them do not allow drinking. So how would a young person have an outlet? About 20 organizations, terrorist organizations, have recognized this. They have been ahead of us. And they have gone and courted the young people in this country. They offer them a job, respect, training, recruit them, and tell them that you join us. If you want a wife, we have many young ladies who want to marry a jihadist warrior. And if you don't want a wife, some of them, like Boko Haram, Nusafra, have gone and kidnapped young girls and provided it to these young men as sex slaves. Can you believe that? And again, there is so many of this. We only hear ISIS. There is Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in Peninsula. There is Boko Haram, Jamaat Islamiyya, Al-Shabaab, Nusafran, about 20 of them. If you want to be really scared, go to Wikipedia, do a search on global terrorist incidents. In 2014, the number of incidents per month were around 25 to 50 per month. Same in 2015. 25 to 50 terrorist incidents happened. We only heard in 2015 about two of them, the one in Paris and the one in San Bernardino. That's it. The rest of the world does not hear when terrorist activity happens in Bangladesh, in Niger, in Nigeria, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Kazakhstan, in Azerbaijan, in Pakistan. Nobody hears about them. The international media does not cover it. But what is really scary is in 2016, the numbers in August, I believe, was as much as 230 terrorist incidents per month. I don't know at what point the parents of the children in those countries are going to say, hey, our country is not safe. Time to move away, become a refugee. If you believe we have had in US and Europe refugee problem, wait till instead of having refugees from Syria and Iraq, wait if it was increased to five countries, 10 countries. That's why it is our problem. It's not just Pakistan's problem, Bangladesh's problem, Saudi Arabia's problem. It is our problem, the global community, to do something about it. Now we can say, what can we do? We are all victims. There is zero chance to do something. Or we can go and be heroes and go from zero to hero. How can we do that? The quickest way to create jobs is to create innovation jobs, knowledge economy. From fossil-based economies, you need access to natural resources. You have to have a lot of contact. In innovation economy, all you need is people with good brains, young people, and all these countries have amazing number of good people. I was in Lagos, Nigeria. 10,000 high-tech enthusiasts came to this conference. I lost my voice after third day. How many lectures can you give? How many workshops can you have? It's not just Cameron trying to do something. We are all going to do something. That's why at 500 Startups, we are having a gigs on a plane to go to Africa 
one of our first stops is in Lagos, Nigeria. We'll go to four different cities in Africa, try to build bridges, go and do something that makes sense. Another good thing about innovation economy is you do not need the blessing of the leaders of many of these countries, which do not understand the world is changing. They are still dictators living in dark ages. Without the blessing of the old men who are in charge of the businesses in these countries, young people can disrupt the business scene. When Amazon started to move bits around with high level of integrity, it replaced the old businesses like bookstores. When Uber is moving bits around with a high level of trust so that the drivers and the passengers can cooperate with each other, rate each other, it is revolutionizing the taxi businesses all over the world that are controlled by old men who want no competition. So that's the way to go. And a lot of that knowledge started in Silicon Valley, but by building bridges, we can create many, many more centers of innovation excellence. Because every one of those countries have amazing youth who can do something to help their own country. Whether their leaders approve it or not, whether their leaders understand it or not, it's in the hands of people like you. There are people from 45 countries sitting in here. I reach out to you. You are the heroes, you are my heroes. Go and create jobs. Teach as many people as you can in your country and in your neighboring countries. Help each other. So at BIT Amina Center at House School of Business, UC Berkeley, we have this huge initiative to create 10 million innovation jobs in the next 10 years. You might say that's crazy. We are working on creating hip videos if any of you have good ideas about what I said, help me. Send me one minute, 30 seconds, two minute videos that are hip. That say, hey, be cool and start a company. We want to reach 50 million young people across these 32 countries. Inspire them. Very few will have the guts to go and get started. Entrepreneurs are very special people. I'm counting on 2% of them, 1 million entrepreneurs to say, hey, I have an idea for a company. We know many companies fail to go from idea to creation of a business. So I'm assuming half of them will be failing. But the other half, we need to invest in them small amount of money. I'm not saying millions of dollars. $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, $50,000, $100,000. Small sums of money relative to what we have to do in Silicon Valley. And again, I'm assuming half of them would fail and cannot scale up. But the 250000 that remain, these are great companies. Let's put the systems together to give them serious money. Give them $1 million, $2 million, $5 million. Bring them to centers of high tech and accelerate them, educate them how to build bridges, how to go and create global connections to make their companies become global. Create many jobs locally by creating global companies. I'm assuming, again, more than half of them would fail. But if within the next 10 years, we create 100,000 new companies. Each one of them have an average of 100 employees. That's where you get your math for 10 million. How I earned my degree in math? Does this work? <laughs> Thanks. So what do we teach them? 
we need to teach them what we call at Berkeley high-tech prunership. It's high-tech entrepreneurship, which is leveraged by broadband. Why is broadband important? When I was starting my first company in 1980, oh my God, that's a long time ago. I was only two or three years old, so don't think I'm an old man. When I was starting my first company, I needed $1.8 million to get started because I had to buy so many servers, computers. I had to, I couldn't have access to cloud, to the SaaS model, business model, to just pay as you go and start with a few dollars. There were no co-working spaces. Today is different. And it will give our young people access to broadband, they can use their brains to come up and do amazing things. And we need to teach them, the old investors, how to invest in high tech entrepreneurship. And we need to teach them social high tech entrepreneurship and social impact. Is my time up? Should I? Okay, <laughs> two more minutes. So, this is something that we can do. We want to teach everyone. You can be a good person, develop a great product, develop a great service that takes care of your customers, so your customers love you. Take care of your employees. Do not destroy environment, do not destroy lives just to make money. And if you do all of this, you can still have the greatest, highest valuation in the market and your shareholders will be very happy. You don't believe me? Look at Google, look at eBay, look at Apple, look at Amazon. All these companies make great products everybody loves and their employees love working there, and they make a commitment to make the world a better place. 10 years ago, the highest value companies in the world, the top six, one of them was a high tech company. Last year, five of them were high tech companies. So you can be good, do amazing amount of work, be my personal hero, and also make a lot of money. Thank you so much. Love you all.